very simply, what Brother Matthew was just singing about is what we're going to see in Scripture this morning. Jesus gave himself for you. For you. This is personal. This isn't just some, some you know, going out and, and broadcasting grass seed and hoping some of it takes. Yes, that, that's a gospel story that we can preach in another time. What I want you to understand when you look at the cross is that the cross is personal. It's personal. Jesus said that, and we're going to see it in our text. Jesus said that the cross was for you. And the resurrection validates everything, everything that God did in and through the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our scripture this morning, we have a lot of scripture this morning, and and y'all know I, I have always loved standing in honor of the reading of God's Word. And if you're able to stand, I know we've got a lot of scripture this morning, but would you stand in honor of the reading of God's Word? We're going to start in Luke 22 verses 14 through 20. When the hour had come, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I'm going to read this to you the way it is in Greek. With desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall never again eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he said, take this and share it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. And then our next text is in Luke 24, verses 1 through 12. But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men suddenly stood near them in dazzling clothing. And as the women were terrified and bowed their heads to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living one among the dead? He is not here, but he has risen. Remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee, saying that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words and returned from the tomb and reported all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now they were Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James also, the other women were with or with them were telling these things to the apostles. But these words appeared to them as nonsense, and they would not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen wrappings only, and he went away to his home, marveling at what had happened. And finally, Acts chapter 2, verses 37 through 39. Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. Let's pray. Father God, we love you so much, and we just thank you for these 
words that you have given to us. Father, as you illumined the heart and mind of Luke when you gave to these words, gave to him these words in his gospel and, and in the book of Acts, we just pray that you would illumine our hearts and minds this morning as well, that you would speak to us profoundly this morning and help us to understand that the good news is for us. We offer this prayer, our love and our lives, in and through the name of our risen Lord and Master, Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. You may be seated. I told you last week that, that the Holy Week, okay, beginning on Palm Sunday. I mean, Palm Sunday is one of those, uh, you know, the, 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 those Christian uh, holidays that, that it's really easy to preach. Okay, and Easter. Listen, when I meet with young preacher boys, when they come to me and say that that God has called me to preach and and they're approaching Easter, I tell them, listen, if all you got to say on Easter morning is this, what's on the front of our bulletin, if all you do is stand there and shout, he has risen for 20 minutes, that's an Easter sermon. That'll preach. And you preach that sermon that God has given to you. You see, beloved, it is this week, okay? It is this week. Remember? Remember in the Old Testament? book we don't read too often? The book of Esther? And, and Esther is in danger. Because Haman doesn't like the Jews and he wants to have them killed. And so he tricks the king into making an edict that will let all of the people of the land go and just have a field day killing Jews. Esther is the queen, and she's the king's favorite. And she feels like she's being called by God to do something. But that old devil gets up in her and says, if you do that, he's going to have you killed. And then what good will you accomplish? And Mordecai, Mordecai comes to her and he says, Esther, who knows but that every single moment of your life up to this moment has been pointing to exactly this. That's not what Scripture says, but it is what it says. I didn't quote it exactly, but that's what Mordecai is saying. Every experience you've had, let me tell you something, beloved. Y'all know my testimony. You've heard it. There's a lot of things in my testimony I'm not proud of. But let me tell you something. Every single thing in my testimony brought me to this place at this time for this reason to do what I'm doing right now. Every mistake I made, maybe I hadn't found the person yet that I need to share with him, you know, I did this and God redeemed me. God still had a place for me in his kingdom. I said all of that to say this. The last 33 years of Jesus' life have been pointing forward to this week. The last 33 years of Jesus' life have been pointing forward to three hours on a cross on a day we call Good Friday. The last 33 years of Jesus' life and ministry have been pointing forward to an empty tomb on the outskirts of Jerusalem. As I began praying what God would have me say this morning, that, that amazing song came up. And so if y'all ever see me driving down the road, and I might even have both hands up in there, okay? Especially on a straightaway, all right? If y'all ever see me driving down the road with my hand up, there's a real good chance that song is what's playing right now, okay? You can just flip over to Caleb and you'll go, yep, I know what the pastor's got his worship on about. All right. I've told you all throughout my ministry that the Bible makes it abundantly clear that salvation is not about us. Romans 8, I mean, makes that point specifically. But what I think I've been very not good at telling you is that even though our salvation is not about us, it is for us. 
it is for us. See, beloved, our salvation is not just, is not just so that God can say, okay, they're righteous, they're good. There is a purpose to that. I told you last week that Palm Sunday, that the cross, all of that was a means to an end that God was using. You see, beloved, you can't have a resurrection unless you've had a death. You can't be brought back to life unless you have first died. And Jesus, in, in, in instituting and celebrating this last Passover with, with His men, is telling them He's recontextualizing. Okay? Do you understand what He's doing? He's taking all of the Mosaic Law, wrapping it all up in a nice, neat package and tying a bow on the top of it and saying, guys, all of the Old Testament was pointing forward to me. All of the Old Testament was pointing forward to what we have done in Jerusalem this week. And so Jesus knows what's about to happen. And He wants these men to understand that the crucifixion certainly is the way that God paid the penalty for our sin. We'll we'll, we'll see that in a moment. But it was also the means to get to the end and the end was the resurrection and the end of the resurrection was our salvation and the reason for our salvation listen to me beloved is not just that we would be righteous it is because God wants to spend eternity with us you know I could get up here and preach a bunch of negative stuff and I know sometimes I have to especially when we're preaching from the prophets. But what I want you to hear very clearly this morning is that this is for you. Everything that Jesus did is for you. What I want us to see this morning is that Jesus spent His last night on earth. How would you spend your last night on earth? If you knew, it's 10 after 11. Okay, no complaints. So it's 10 after 11. No, I'm kidding. If you knew that 24 hours from right now you were going to die, how would you spend the last 24 hours of your life? Would celebrating the Lord's Supper even come up on your radar? For most of us, it probably wouldn't. It's Passover, we know. But here's the problem. I know none of us have ever run into the Lord's Supper with a whole bunch of other stuff on our mind. The kind of week that we had just gone through or the week we know we're getting ready to face or the doctor's appointment we've got tomorrow morning and, and, and our bodies were going through the motions but our heart and our mind just really weren't engaged. The Jews have been celebrating the Passover for around 1,400 years now. And you think Baptists got some old traditions, okay? They've been celebrating Passover for around 1,400 years. At this point in their lives, it is a cold, dead, empty ritual that they go through once a year. Because we've always done it this way. Jesus spends his last night on earth contextualizing what God was saying through the Passover all along. And what do you think those 11 men, the next year at Passover, they celebrated Passover entirely different, with an entirely different mindset? as they went through that ritual. Anyway, we got to get moving. Jesus showed the apostles and us that God is for us. Now, what about the Passover? Passover, as you know, was the very last meal that the Jews ate in their captivity. 
Exodus 12 tells us all about this if you want to go back and read all of this. But the, one of the most important verses is verse 5. Your lamb shall be unblemished. Got to be perfect. And then in verse 7, uh, God tells them, You shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel. What would that remind you of if you had just seen Jesus crucified on a cross? The blood from the back of his head and the blood from his arms. 1,400 years prior, God said, put the sign of the cross on your door. Put the sign of the cross on your door. And then in verse 13, why did he tell him to do that? I love this. The blood shall be a sign for you. For you. On the houses where you live, and when I see the blood, I will pass over, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. See, beloved, we think that the Old Testament is all about law and performance, and certainly if you wanted to be a perfect saint, man, you had to do a lot of stuff. But God, in beginning this whole journey with Him, He said this blood will be a sign for you. God is doing all the work. God is doing everything that needs to be done to get them out of captivity. Now, we could spend the rest of this sermon and another one going through all of the elements that you find in a traditional uh, Jewish Passover meal. Not important. Why are they not important? How many of them are mentioned in the New Testament? Two. And so we're going to talk about those two. Because those are the two that Jesus contextualized to be Him. Now, quickly. It is Maundy Thursday. Well, we're back in Luke 22. It is Maundy Thursday. Maundy is a word that comes from Latin. Uh, it, it, it doesn't sound familiar to us, but we get our word mandate from it. Okay? And Maundy uh, Thursday uh, is command Thursday. What command are we talking about? John 13, 34. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another even as I have loved you. Do you understand that that's just the whole Ten Commandments backwards? The first four commandments in Exodus 20 talk about your relationship with God, your vertical relationship. The next six commandments deal with your horizontal relationships, your relationships with other people. A new commandment I give to you that you take care of those horizontal relationships even as I have taken care of the vertical relationship and you are taking care of it as well. That's Ten Commandments. See, beloved, we have trouble remembering ten. Okay? And so Jesus bottom lined it. I mean, these are men, right? Ladies, you're going out. He had to bottom line it for him. He bottom lined it for him. Love one another the way that I've loved you. Do I need to go there? Husbands. Yeah, I need to go there. What did Paul tell us? Love your wife how? The way you want to. No. He said, love your wife the way that Christ loved the church. Whole other sermon, we'll get there on Father's Day. Amen? Even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Man, have you ever been loved? I mean loved. Loved. And you know what happens when you are loved? I mean loved, loved. Somebody's got a song, I don't know who it is, the whole chorus of it is loved, 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 and eventually it gets on my nerves and I have to listen to the next song, but... But, but, you know, I get it. They're, they're talking about this love, love. They're expressing that they have experienced the love of Jesus. And, and the only natural response to that is to express that love into the life of another person, into the life of the people around them. Look at verse 15, back in Luke. He said to them, I told you when I read it, in Greek this is a very strong. It says, he said to them, I have desired, or with desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. You know, none of them said, wait a minute, Jesus, what's this suffering all about? 
They just kind of accepted that. And Jesus is saying to them, listen, Passover is about to happen. And you say, wait, Passover is happening. They are sitting at the table eating a Passover meal. That's true enough. But the real Passover is not going to happen until tomorrow. The real Passover is not going to happen until Friday. When the lamb is slaughtered and put on the cross to pay the price for our sin. There's a lot to unpack here. Jesus is passionate about this Passover. We know from John's Gospel, John is the only one that records for us three Passovers that, that Jesus celebrated with his men. So we know that Jesus, this is Jesus' 33rd Passover, his third with these men. And yet he says to them, with desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Why? Why is this Passover? It's not just because it's his last one. And in fact, he tells us. He even told us in, 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 in the first group of verses that we read that it's not his last Passover, right? Right? He tells us that there's going to be at least one more. I say to you, verse 16, I shall not eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. So this is not his last Passover. There will be at least one more in the life and ministry of Jesus. But Jesus wants to contextualize what God has been pointing toward all along. Listen, beloved. All of us have been in school and we've gone through the teaching that the teacher or the professor was trying to communicate to us. And at some point, the teacher has to say, I've given you all that you need. Clear your desk. Here's the test. And so Jesus has given them all that they need And he's now contextualizing and showing them that the law, just like Paul says in his epistles, that the law has been a schoolmaster. It's been a teacher. The purpose of the law was to get these men to this night with this man at this time so that he could tell them that what he was about to do on the cross was for them. Because let me tell you something. If my best friend and the guy, you know, my favorite Bible teacher, Jesus is their favorite Bible teacher, all of a sudden on Friday ends up on a cross dead, that's going to mess with my head. I'm going to wonder, well, how could this have possibly happened? I've watched him raise people from the dead, and yet now he's lying dead. How can that happen? Verse 17, he tells them, take this cup and share it among themselves. Yeah, that's exactly what it means. They used a common cup. Not advocating for that, but that is how they did it. They used a common cup and shared it among themselves. And then in verse 20, he says he took the cup and he said, this cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. See, Jesus is saying to them that everything he's done, again, he's contextualizing his entire three years of ministry with them. And he says that everything that I've done, everything that I've said, everything that I've taught you has been for you. And in verse 19, see, these are men. How do you teach men? How do you teach boys? We're visual learners. You can tell me something until you're blue in the face. But if you let me do it, that's why teachers, they have a fancy word for these things. They're called manipulatives. Okay? 
They're things that the children can touch and count and put together to learn the concepts that are being taught to them. You talk to me about the blood, okay, yeah, well, okay, that's a little bit too abstract. When he had taken it, or when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body. You're going to be able to see this. You're going to be able to watch my body be beaten within an inch of its life. You're going to be able to watch my body get hung on the cross. You're going to be able to watch me die. And I want you to understand that when I utter that last word from the cross, that all of this was done for you. It was done for you. And back in verse 20, he tells them the same thing about his blood. Hebrews 9, 22. According to the law, one may almost say all things are cleansed with blood, and without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Beloved, oceans of blood have been offered on the altar in Jerusalem and in synagogues all across the empire. And those people were still lost and going to a sinner's hell. Jesus said, that didn't work. My blood will be sufficient. And that's why he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood given for you. He wants them to understand that there is meaning in His death. This, this isn't just meaningless. He wants them to understand that His death fulfills all of the prophecies, all of the things that were taught in the Old Testament. Everything has been pointing toward Him. He wants them to understand that on Friday night and Saturday when it looks like their world has come to a complete stop, come to an end, and they are fools, that everything that He did and said was pointing forward to this. We understand quickly that he was the Passover meal ended. Jesus said, "Let's go to the garden to pray." Peter arms himself for a prayer meeting. Man, what kind of church does Peter go to? Yeah. He's got to arm himself to go to a prayer meeting. They go to the garden Jesus is betrayed with the kiss of a friend. He's arrested. He heals the guy. He's taken to Pilate, taken to Herod, taken to Pilate, beaten within an inch of his life, sentenced to die for crimes he never committed, forced to carry his cross through Jerusalem, When they got to Golgotha, they stripped him naked. They laid him out on the cross. They drove those nails. And they weren't little nails, beloved. They drove those nails through his wrist and his ankles to hold him onto the cross. He hangs on the cross for three hours in our Jesus. Our Jesus even has a ministry on the cross. How many of us would look at the people that were reviling against us and lead them to faith in Jesus? It's another sermon. He leads a man to faith in Jesus. Jesus wants us to understand that He is not reacting. John 10, 18. No one has taken it, my life, away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my Father. So we understand Jesus is not reacting. Jesus is not going, oh my goodness, this thing came off the rails. i got to figure out a way to get God's plan back on the rails. The scribes and the Pharisees. Yeshua! Man, you all that in the back of chips? Call down 10,000 angels. You come down off that cross and we'll get a knee. We'll get a knee right here. 
Jesus is not going to derail God's plan. Finally, the moment arrives. John tells us about it. Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. He died. It's over. These men just can't understand. Well, a member of the Sanhedrin, you know the rest of the story. He was a secret disciple. He'd come to know Jesus and embrace him. He went to Pilate. Notice he didn't go to the Sanhedrin. He went to Pilate. And he said, Pilate, can I have his body to give it a, a decent burial? Pilate says, yeah. So Joseph and maybe Nicodemus and, and some of the women go and they put him in the tomb. Saturday. Crush him. You know, everybody in this room has had someone you love die. Shocking the day that it happens. But you're numb, right? I mean, you're numb. When you get the call or when you're with them and you see them draw their final breath. You know the day that's the worst? The next day. You've had time to think about it. Process it. Remember all of the good times. Saturday must have been crushing. Crushing for these people. Well, they knew that because of the Jewish law, they hadn't been able to finish what they, they needed to do. They hadn't been able to pay their final respects to Jesus. Not really clear on how they're going to be able to move this huge stone away from the, the, the door of the tomb. They make their way out there. What would you do if your loved one were buried in our cemetery and as you were driving into the cemetery to lay flowers on their grave, you noticed that the tombstone had been toppled or defaced. That'd crush you, wouldn't it? That hurt bad. And as they're approaching this tomb, they see it's open. Oh, no. Who could have done this? Who could have possibly done this? Why would they do this? They enter the tomb. God just gave me this thought early this morning. I was watching this show last night about this guy that owns a some kind of car, a junkyard and all of this, and he restores cars. And He bought a, a bus, like a 15-passenger bus, really cheap. It was an impound. He fixed it up for this group in Gettysburg that does battlefield tours. We like to go and tour battlefields to see where famous battles were fought. <laughs> These women walked in and they toured the most famous battlefield uh, that's ever been on earth because that battlefield is where death met its match. That battlefield is where death was finally defeated. Suddenly, Two men were with them. It's clear that they're angels. And then in verse 7 of Luke 24, it, the, the angels remind them, this isn't an accident. The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men. He must be crucified. And if He has to be, if He must be delivered, and He must be crucified, then He must, on the third day, rise again. So, here's the thing. What did the angels do to bring comfort to these women? They took them back to the words of Jesus. Great place to go. Great place to go when you don't know what to do. When, when things are not going well in your lives. So they hear the redemptive story of God. Obviously they go, I know we're short on time. They go and they tell Peter and the disciples. Peter said, you know, they listen to me. They go and tell the church. This is the church. They go and tell the church that Jesus has risen from the dead. And what does the church do? Silly women. Idle tales. Now you honestly come in here uh, all excited like that. 
thinking we're going to believe that Jesus is risen from the dead. Peter at least remembers a little bit about what Jesus had said, and so he does at least go to the tomb. He doesn't go in, but he sticks his head in and goes, oh. well, isn't that a puzzler? All right, well, that's a good walk. I'm going to go home now. He doesn't tell anybody what he's seen. He just goes back to the house. We know that the Peter and the other disciples see Jesus. They go back to Galilee as Jesus told them, and in Luke 24, 45, He opened their minds to understand the Scripture. Wouldn't you love to hear that sermon? Wouldn't you love to hear how Jesus just went from Genesis to where they are right now and tied the whole thing up into a package for them so that they could understand? Luke 24, 49. And behold, I am sending forth the promise of my Father upon you but you are to stay in the city until you're clothed with power on high. Acts 2, real quickly. Luke closes his gospel by telling us that the disciples were spending time every day in the temple praising God. Now, here, here's what I think was happening. How many of y'all, when you got saved, I mean, you just couldn't wait to go tell somebody about Jesus? You didn't know how to do it. You didn't know how to share your faith very effectively. You know how you learn to share your faith effectively? By sharing it ineffectively hundreds of times. I hate to give you that that bad news, but that's how you learn to share your faith effectively. By doing it wrong a lot of times. And so I just got to imagine that Peter and the apostles are in the temple during this time, and they're sharing their faith, maybe not having a whole lot of success. They've drawn some people, okay, They were close and had heard about this. Acts chapter 1 is simply a rehash of the last chapter of Luke's gospel. Acts chapter 2, it's now 50 days from Passover. This is a, a celebration that you and I avoid with everything in our being. It's the, it's the celebration of Pentecost. Because we're afraid we're going to speak in tongues. We're going afraid that we're going to do something that will draw attention to ourselves. But they're in this upper room. They're back in the upper room. They're having a prayer meeting. This feast is a feast that is a prescribed feast for all Jewish men. They have to come to Jerusalem to celebrate this. It's celebrated 50 days after Passover. It's the uh, Feast of Weeks or the Feast of the Harvest. A funny thing happened during their service. Don't you love it? Verses 5 and 6 of Acts 2. Holy Spirit showed up. Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the crowd came together and were bewildered because each of them was hearing them speak in his own language. Real quick, I'm not going to dwell on it. They are not speaking in some private prayer language. If there happened to be a guy that spoke Spanish standing next to him, then you were speaking Spanish. Why? So that you could share the gospel with him. Luke is very careful to tell us that they're speaking known languages. As you can imagine, that didn't sit well. (laughs) That didn't sit well with the leaders of the temple. So they call Peter and and, and all the others to come in and explain this. Now, Peter has had 50 days to prepare this sermon. Okay? That sounds like a long time, but he's got a lot to process. Because basically what he's been asked to do is stand before the Sanhedrin and summarize the entire Old Testament in light of the Jesus event. Okay? And so he's asked to explain it. Acts 2.14. Peter takes his stand with the eleven. And he begins to preach the first Christian sermon. He gives an invitation in verse 21. It shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Funny, he's quoting the Old Testament there in another sermon. He then begins to summarize all of the Old Testament and lays brick by brick for them that Jesus really is the one that God promised. Verse 23, this man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. No accident here. 
You nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men, literally it's lawless men, and put him to death. You see, beloved, the cross was no mistake. It was for you. He then shows them that the cross did not have the final word. Verse 24. God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death. Not just for Jesus, beloved. He put an end to the agony of death for you and me as well. The resurrection was for you. And then he concludes his message in verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Some of them were actually listening to his sermon, verse 39. Brother, what should we do? Peter says, the promise is for you. The promise is for you. Beloved, do you understand? The promise is for you. The cross is for you. For you, the resurrection is for you. His body was broken for you. His blood was shed for you. Will you respond to him this morning and say, Thank you, Lord Jesus, that everything that you did is for me.